afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Redberry Wheel here, and welcome to another one of my Aerospace Dimension modules. This one is module two, and it discusses chapter one in it. If you have not ever taken a class with engines, or if you're not familiar with how airplanes work, then this is a good intro video. It does not go super in depth. So if you are like pursuing your private pilot's license or something like that, then it's just a brief introduction. So don't expect too much, but this video will help you prepare for the module two test. The different components discussed in this video are talking about engines, specifically the internal combustion or reciprocating engine, different instruments within an airplane that help you fly, and discusses how each of those components work. And if you're up for the challenge of this video, then let's, let's go ahead and get started. There are different types of reciprocating engines and reciprocating engine or the internal combustion engine basically means it takes air with a mixture of fuel and then it combusts within the engine to generate power and let the engine do whatever it's needing to do, whether it be move a car forward or an airplane with like moving the propeller. That's how the internal combustion engine works. There are different types of internal combustion engines. The book has a few diagrams like the V inline combustion engine or the inline or the opposing inline or the radial. And it's just the location of the different pistons on the engine. Now a piston is a very important part of an engine. And I will have a diagram here that shows the different steps that a piston goes through in order to generate the required movement for like the crankshaft within the engine to function. So first it takes in the required energy. So the air mixed with the fuel, it squeezes it, which causes ignition and power and then results in exhaust. And so it, it goes through a little spin, <laughs> like it, it spins and moves up and down spinning and it's a cool process, and I'll, I'll link to a video of a working engine, but that that's just a brief description of how a piston works. So there are three commonly used types of engines on aircraft. There's the reciprocating engine, there's the turbojet, and there's a rocket. And the reciprocating one I had just described, but a jet, it it's just everything is in one line. And it starts at the beginning with the intake, and it goes through a processing, heating, squeezing, and then combusts out the end, which allows for thrust. And then a rocket, which just has a fuel source and liquid oxygen, they combine and boom. It allows the rocket to have thrust. The next part of the chapter talks about gravity-fed fuel, and it's pretty self-explanatory. That means if you're in a Cessna aircraft, which has high wings, which means the wings are like at the top, of, of the body of the aircraft or the fuselage, then the fuel in the wings is fed into the engine just solely through gravity. So there isn't anything pushing the fuel or pumping the fuel from the wings into the aircraft. There are some aircraft that have low wings, so they might be below where the entrance is or the, the canopy entrance and in those instances, sometimes you have to pump the fuel into the engine. There is a carburetor system within aircraft, which is where the air is combined with the fuel or the, the, the vapor of the fuel. And you can think of it as a little bit of a, a mixing bowl where it mixes the, the two together. There is such thing as carburetor ice, where essentially the, the flow of air and the moisture in the air creates ice on the inside of the the carburetor and it can actually block the the flow of fuel into the engine resulting in well what happens if your engine doesn't have fuel anymore you don't have any more thrust and your engine doesn't work anymore and that's the reason why some airplanes have carb heat which is carburetor heat where you take the heat of the engine and apply it directly to the carburetor so that it doesn't generate that ice when you're going at low air speeds. 
So in an airplane, there are two major knobs that you need to know for power. There's a red one that is for the mixture or how much fuel is being pushed into the engine. And then there's a black one called the throttle, which controls the power or the RPM, the rotations per minute of the engine as, as you are flying. Typically when you're taking off, you have full mixture or the it, it's pushed all the way in and full throttle, which means you are applying max power to your engine. So because of the engine and the rotations that it does, it generates power or electricity within the airplane to power a bunch of different instruments that are powered by a battery. If you're familiar with cars, cars also have batteries and they don't just have one charge. The engine is constantly charging that battery and the life can be pretty long for a battery as long as it's constantly being charged and the chemicals stay in proper balance within the battery. And if you are curious about the electrical systems, I, I will be including um, the copy of a POH or a pilot operating handbook for a Cessna 172 in the description down below. And if you want to check out the system section, then you can look at the different electrical systems. There are these little knobs that are called circuit breakers along the, like, in front of where the pilot is sitting. And if one of them pops out, typically that means there's a problem with one of the electrical components, whether it be a wire or a problem somewhere in the electrical system. And depending on what that might be, it could determine whether or not you fly. So there are some very important components in an aircraft that are used to measure what's going on. And there are instruments that tell us about the status of the engine, including the oil and the temperature of that oil as it circulates through the system. Additionally, there is a tachometer, which says the rotations per minute that the aircraft's engine is going and has a running total on the number of hours that the engine has been running. The altimeter tells the pilot what the altitude is given the pressure that is in the current conditions. Whenever the pilot is getting the weather, or typically known as the METAR, the meteorological information for the area, then they take that information of what the pressure is and dial it into the altimeter to tell the accurate altitude of where they are located. Sometimes if there's an extreme change in pressure from like the weather being very drastically different between different times that the planes fly, it could be off by as, up, as high as maybe 400 or 500 feet, which could be the difference between life and death if you're trying to take off and then land safely. The vertical velocity indicator indicates how quickly you are moving up in altitude or down in altitude in feet per minute. So it might say you're moving 500 feet down per minute, depending on what the power of your engine is. The one, one big point that I would like to make is that pitch, pitch of the airplane, the, the way that the, the noses up or down controls airspeed and the throttle, the, the little black knob that I talked about earlier, controls your altitude. And by balancing those two things, you can adjust how fast you're climbing or descending. And what might be called the, the plane's speedometer or how fast it's going is the airspeed indicator, which is what I just talked about. Airspeed is controlled by what? The pitch of the airplane, right? So depending on how far back or forward your nose is determines how quickly you're moving through the air. So a gyroscope is something that several instruments in an airplane are based upon. And a gyroscope is essentially where you've got, if, if you think of like a spinning top and someone spins it, and then if you rotate it and then it, it shifts its orientation along with this, the center point, it's kind of like that where there's a rotor and it's spinning perpendicularly to the surface. And that determines how the attitude indicator is, which shows the, the artificial horizon in the aircraft. And it also shows the, the pilot what direction they are going with the heading indicator, which, which is based off of the readings off of the compass as well. 
typically there's an instrument that is electrically based, but it shares the same information as that gyroscopic instrument with the artificial horizon, which is called the turn coordinator. The chapter goes into a little bit of depth about what a glass cockpit is. It's basically where you have a GPS and you have a, a lot of instruments and electrical capabilities like radios and everything using touchscreens. Not all cap airplanes have them and I learned in a plane that didn't even have a GPS so I had to use a map, a sectional map to learn everything so that was a lot of fun but a lot of planes have GPS nowadays, which is the global positioning system where the signals are sent to a satellite or there, there's a net of satellites out in the atmosphere and it helps you pinpoint where you are specifically located, wherever you are, either on Earth or in the atmosphere. And as a pilot, this can be really useful if you're looking for a specific location, like if you're searching for someone, then you can enter in the coordinates and then the GPS will plot out the route that you need to go. Depending on how advanced the GPS system is, newer ones typically have it, older ones, eh, kind of, you just follow the magenta line. <laughs> and that pretty much summarizes everything you need to know for GPS. The end of the chapter has some information on activities that you can do if you want to understand how gyroscopic spinning works. So I will include a nice little link down below on how to get to those activities, specifically just sharing the module with you. And if you have any questions for me about content in this video, please feel free to ask and I will get back to you as soon as I can. So thank you guys so much for watching and that is all folks. Until next time, toodles.